All right, so uh, we have uh, Jimmy P. Brown here with us today. And uh, for those who are crazy and don't know, he is the singer, mastermind, songwriter, guitar player, the man behind Deliverance. And in a recent video that I made, uh, we just saw the release with all the glare of uh, Deliverance's Learn LP. It's been remastered for album and CD. So I just thought it'd be a cool time to... Because uh, this, like I had mentioned in an email before, this had uh, came out before we all had internet world, and you know, so uh, most right of, on the cusp, right on the cusp of it. <laughs> yeah, most of what we had was uh, would have been just in print, and so uh, today's new audience probably don't really have an idea what print is as much. So, <laughs> yeah. those of us who did magazines in the day. Anyway, I just thought because I I gave this a listen yesterday um, for the first time on vinyl, as it says there. First time on vinyl. Um, yes. I've, I've joined the vinyl craze, and so I have all of those. And um, gave it a listen, cranked it up, and it was just, you know, it was like a new experience. It was great. But um, awesome. it, thinking about some of the songs, and I thought, well, let's go in and see about getting uh, some background history on this record. And um, some of the songs, maybe some of the lyrics, maybe some of the mindset behind it. Um, first off, though, We've seen a lot of Deliverance reissues, and you're still making music now. And we've seen, I mean, I just grabbed all the stuff that I had, and just recently. So we've got, you know, Greetings of Death. Greeting right. Death. I'm sorry, don't put that yeah, up. Yeah, greeting, the Greeting of Death <laughs> demo. Yeah, uh, And that's where it started with me. I had that cassette back in the day, and I think that's probably one of the first times I think I reached out and spoke to you many, many moons yeah. ago. I mean, it was just, it was great. And then, of course, the first, and most of these have not been on vinyl except for these very first couple. Um, the first, yeah, just just uh, de just Deliverance and Weapons were the only ones released on vinyl back in the day. Right. Yeah. And now, of course, we keep seeing them reissued, and um, mm -hmm. and then the, one of the more recent ones, Day of Execution, of course. Yes. Now we get to insert Learn in there. We are. It's kind of weird how they're doing these, not in the exact order, but you know, River Disturbance. Yeah. And. And then, of course, the two more recent ones here with a say and yes. newest. So, and of course, I know as a uh, supporter, one of the few who supported the, <laughs> the Smithereens reissue, that that is hopefully you know forthcoming. So, um, oh yeah, you're gonna, you're, you're uh, everyone is going to hear it as it was intended. That's uh, right. It's, I have another concept record I'm working on <laughs> mm. that's in the in the in the works right now. Uh, uh, about it. It, it's not it ties into everything that's going on right now with the coronavirus and and, and all of this that's going on publicly. Uh, that what we've been experiencing it kind of ties into it. But I started writing this concept record years ago, um, and it's called Guidestones. Uh, and uh, I don't know how much you know about the uh, Georgia guy stones, but it kind of uh, takes from those tenants and 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 uh, goes into this wacky world of conspiracy. So wow. <laughs> it's going to be very very cool. <laughs> yeah, look forward to it. So I assume this is a, a more another solo album, not a Deliverance album, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 you know I'm kind of, I uh, when we got back from Europe, I told the boys, um, you know, I called them all and 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 just said, you know, I I, I want to concentrate right now more on uh, my solo material. Um, as a matter of fact, I really don't want to record any more Deliverance per se. Uh, I'd like us to do live shows. And so, you know, if, if people want to bring us out, do some live gigs and highlight the, the, you know, the 30 plus year career of deliverance. Great. Um, but you know, when we did the subversive kind, it was, it was cool and it was a nice little throwback. Um, but it certainly wasn't where my heart was and what I was wanting to do. Cause you know, at that time I was doing a racer head too. I was working on my first solo album and that's kind of more along the lines of where I was wanting to go. And even then the eraser head album, those, all those songs were years old. Um, I just had finally put them all together and um, you know, music has been such a, it's been such an on and off thing for me for the last 16 years of my life. And the reason being is because, you know, I, I, you know, once everything ended in 96, uh, the official end of deliverance back then, 
um, you know, I was forced to, you know, go out into the working world and get a job and be a normal bloke and, and just live life and take care of my family and, you know, and all that other stuff. And, and, uh, so I just dove head first and every once in a while I'd get, you know, I was pulled back and <clears throat> told, okay, well, let's do assimilation. And then, so, you know, I pulled that and we did the assimilation record and, uh, didn't happen. That's, an, that's another album that didn't happen the way it was supposed to, but <laughs> nonetheless, we recorded it and we got it done. Um, and then, uh, pulled back again. I went right back into the work world again. And then, uh, I did some fearful symmetry records. I did a couple of Jupiter six records and, and then, um, uh, the next deliverance record was what um, almost six years later, which was uh, the as above so below album. And, that one was a lot of fun, but it was definitely more Mike Phillips pulling me and uh, I, I don't want to say forcing me, but definitely convincing me that, oh, let's do a record. And we did some uh, South American dates to support it. And then a few years later, hear what I say. And hear what I say was truly going to be the last record. It was going to be the last Deliverance album for, for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, we keep hearing that. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and, and I really intended it to be so. Um, then um, we got this, this offer to do Mexico, and, and uh, now I was playing with a whole new group. You know, I was playing with Jim and, and Victor, and of course George was back when we did Mexico. And then, um, then we thought, let's record. And George had his worldview thing going on, and, and, uh, but me and Jim and Victor had a good feel with each other at the time, and so we, we tracked uh, Subversive. and. That was cool, um, but again, it was it was kind of more uh, a throwback, you know. Oh, the, you know, remember when? You know, this is when it was thrash and heavy and cool, and and uh, you know, as uh, diversified as everybody is, you know, uh, Victor is incredibly diversified in his music and his tastes and what he listens to and what he performs. But he's also a hermit and he doesn't perform anymore. So it was a little strange for him to get back in the studio. And then Jim plays in all sorts of cover bands. And, uh, and then he's always trying to work on a, a multitude of different projects. He just doesn't want to be typecast as a thrash drummer or a punk drummer. A punk drummer, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard when, when that's kind of what you made your career. And, and, and trust me, I know because I fight the same thing, you know, because uh, any type, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I like all my synth music I released under the name Purple Symmetry. I really didn't want my name on it. And um, because I just knew people weren't going to be as receptive towards it. And same with uh, Jupiter Six, you know. Um, but I finally just got tired of it. And with the encouragement of Michael Sweet, uh, you know, it was just, you know, it, you know, it was time to go fully solo and just use my name. And, and that's, that's how Eraserhead happened. And, now uh things going on with my patreon and and uh this is what i'm doing for work and and <laughs> it's not paying much but it's fun and, and it's allowing me to continue to do music you know uh which is what i was put on earth to do you know <laughs> and that's kind of a good segue because really um as we speak about learn i would say this is probably the first deliverance album where you really change sound um yeah stay was the stay was the front runner uh stay was still was kind of heavy in comparison i think stay yeah. with uh, it, I, I when i was making a video yesterday talking about a little bit of the history to me stay was kind of like the black album was for metallica it was a change that people kind of weren't sure about right. but it was still pretty heavy whereas yeah. it was definitely the next step and if yeah, Her, yeah. Her and did. smithereens were even further with your vocal styles and everything but learn to me and even when it came out i didn't care i wasn't a thrash head that had to have thrash i wasn't one of those that held you off to that standard i just loved the solid album that was here and 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 everything yeah. about it so when i revisited it yesterday on vinyl it was just even that much more powerful i'm just like all these songs were there i already had the history with them but they it was like revisiting an old friend it was really great um, oh, that's awesome. But <laughs> definitely, you know, you can definitely, if you were to put the previous, you know, even stay and then put this one on, it, there's a style difference there. I just, I, I just kind of always felt yeah. this was kind of like a turning point that the next couple was. went on. So, <clears throat> but what I'm mostly interested in, in is when you approach the album, what was the, mm -hmm. you know, 
what obviously it was a concerted effort to make such an album, but um, I'm also wondering about some of the lyrics. Now I haven't sat down and read all of the lyrics, but you know, yeah. have songs about 1990 and all that stuff. I'm just, can you tell us some stories behind what you were thinking at the time? Sure. And you know, was this a, Hey, we're going to change directions or did it just happen? Things like, yeah. that. and maybe some of the, what the lyrics mean to you, maybe that people are not picking up on as easily. Sure. Um, well, I, 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 I think we got to roll back just a tad. Um, obviously, after the, what a joke debacle, um, yeah. which, you know, which I, I talked about in one of my YouTube videos uh, on my YouTube channel, uh, you know, we were trying to get kicked off Frontline. That's why we did that album. I mean, that's, we, we tried to make it as horrible as possible. Uh, and uh, it was an intentional, like, let's get, let's get kicked off Frontline, you know? But that's um, like your best album. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do I say about that? Anyway, okay. <laughs> Continue. Um, uh, so, so we uh, after the dismal sales came back and it returned, you know, because Weapons was so huge and it was so successful that uh, what a joke had pre-sold uh, a numerous amount of sales, and and uh, when the re record actually was shipped. Uh, within about three to four months, uh, Frontline just started getting tons of it shipped back to them, and uh, and it was it became the worst selling album, you know, thus far in the history of Deliverance, which was it was only our third record, and um, you know it's no secret. Obviously, George and I weren't in a, a good spot with each other. We were fighting a lot, and uh, uh, Deliverance had now become uh, DeliverCon because you know. Three of the members, my my original members were now gone, and uh, Chris and Brian, and now it was George and Grotto and uh, Johnny Gonzalez who were all in recon, and uh, so that was the running joke. Well, I, I knew Johnny wasn't going to last. You know, he played a few gigs with us. He did the weapons video with us, um, but I knew Johnny wasn't going to last because he wasn't a thrash drummer, and that's when I met uh, Kevin Lee through Jim Chaffin and. Uh, and so that's how that, all that happened. So now uh, it was time to find a new guitar player, and, and we found Phillips. And uh, I had been pitching Terry Taylor to do a solo album. And uh, the label was very against it, but Terry and I had met, and Terry basically said, can I listen to your current band? And I said, sure. And so I happen to have a, a cassette of weapons, put it on. We listened to it sitting in his uh, Ford Taurus SHO on their forget. And we're sitting there listening to it. And he's like, hmm. He's like, why not take that thing you do with your solo stuff, you know, where you get the big baritone vocals. And why don't we combine it with this heavy music? And I go, well, it'll never work. And he goes, well, we won't know until we try. And it's like, okay, so now that came into play. I had just written Save Execution. He asked, are you writing for the new Deliverance record? I said, yes. And, and I showed him Save Execution. He was like, perfect. He's like, let's marry the two together and see what happens. And that's how the, the route of changing. And so I, I asked, you know, well, what about my solo stuff? And he was like, we'll get to that in time. And what it was is the label didn't want to do uh, – my solo album they wanted deliverance to just be the weapons vehicle. part two <laughs> well they didn't necessarily even want weapons part two i will say that uh, the vp at that time his name is mike mcclain was incredibly encouraging of me to follow an artistic path and yeah. he was just like saying you know if, if you don't want to do the, the the thrash metal thing anymore then change but do a slight slow change into where you're going and um, that's what Stay was. Stay turned into that. It was Good the step. experimental. It was an experimental record in a lot of ways because it was just trying to find what we were doing, and uh, and then right in the middle of the recording, you know, we removed Grotto. Um, I temporarily brought Brian Carilla back. Brian uh, did some dates with us. He didn't play anything on the album. Uh, what Grotto didn't play, me and Mike Phillips played. And then, um, so the album was met with great success. In fact, it's the only one that actually charted on Billboard um, and did really well, held its, held its spot there for a number of weeks. 
Um, and then, then came time for learn. And <laughs> I, I, I had only written, I think two or three songs at that point. Um, and Terry and I had a habit. What we would do is we would meet on the beach and I would bring a little radio and, and I would show him songs. Then I would show him lyrics and we would just sit and talk. And that was our way of kind of, that was our pre-production as it were. And learn, uh, I brought him 1990, a demo of 1990 and I brought him a demo of time. And he was like, wow, this is kind of more brooding and, and a little darker. And I said, yeah. And he's like, well, rather than going at it with that big, huge approach of multiple monstrous amount of vocals and everything else like what you did on Stay, why don't we try to just attack this singularly as a band? You got a new band, which I did. I had, uh, at that point, I hired John Knox, or Johnny uh, Maddox and Manny Morales. I'd brought him back to the fold because Manny was our original bass player in 1985. So, uh, and, and Manny brings a whole other character to my writing um, because he's so Sabbath influenced, you know, he's got that geezer Butler thing going and also have a, has a little Noel Redding, you know, the Jimi Hendrix thing. So he definitely brings a whole new element to the table and uh, it influenced where I was going um, because uh, I, I remember reading a review of learn and it said that it was a, uh, a doom metal record. And I thought, God, it's not doom metal at all. And then hmm. if you really listen to it, it's really actually very slow paced. The whole album is incredibly slow paced uh, with the exception of the song, Who Am I? But everything else is pretty slow paced. So it kind of, I could see where they were coming from when they said it, it was kind of a forerunner to doom metal. Um, I think anytime you slow down, it gets compared to doom. <laughs> it's a, yeah, but yeah. I, I think that's true. Those, slow plodding you know heavy yeah rock. i would doom has a sound and i don't think it sounds like doom that's i can see yeah that too. yeah exactly when i think doom i think of bands like ohm and you know just you know and that, that's what i think of when i think of doom metal or even old sabbath you know uh this one was an old sabbath at all so um no. but um I, I I was really excited about it. You know, we brought I brought uh, cellos and and uh, a, four, a four piece quartet. You know, viola, cello, and violins, and and uh, you know, tried to do something different with this one. And uh, time, I I I, I had, at that point I was uh, I had read like like two auto two uh, books about charlie champlin and one of his statements that he made um was he said my only enemy is time and so i i just became really obsessed with that and and i didn't want to sleep anymore and my life at that point the running joke about jimmy brown was that my life was one big sleep after the other because i would literally sleep for 14 15 hours and and just wake up enough to say hi to my kid, my wife, and, and play video games and maybe go to band practice, you know? <laughs> uh, and now all of a sudden it went from sleeping like that to like sleeping two hours a night. And uh, I just, I was just always writing. I was just working and writing on, you know, writing music. And I was working with other people at that time. I was uh, collaborating with 12th Tribe. I was uh, collaborating with uh, Gospel Gangsters. Um, I'd been, I started producing for other local bands and, and, uh, trying to help them get label deals. Uh, of course, we worked with Savior Machine, um, and, uh, you know, things like of that nature. So I was not sleeping a lot, but I was writing and, but I had become obsessed with time. So that's where that song kind of came from. And it's just got this kind of very melancholy feel to it. Um, and uh, but I love the song. But in other words, I think uh, it, the summing up of just what I was consumed with just about the clock ticking and hours slipping away and minutes slipping away from us. Um, it sums up perfectly in that one line right before the solo. It says, you know, our God is not held by time. Yeah. Nor, is, nor, is, he, nor is he constrained, you know, by its hard bindings. That and, stands out uh, to me all the time is when you when you start speaking, when you're not saying yeah. When that, when that, that is just kind of like, I don't know. I just see that and I'm like, I just, it just really connects. 
but yeah, I mean, it, it resonates. Yeah, yeah. It's an interestingly slow song to start off an album for a band that supposedly is, you know, a thrash band. But it's, <laughs> yeah. it's perfect. It's it's beautiful. When I stuck it on again yesterday, it was just like wow. And then when I get to that part, I'm always like, I love that when you say that. So yeah, it's my it's that's my favorite part of the song because, like I said, it's kind of this sad you know, very uh, thought provoking kind of thing about how, wow, this sucks, you know, and, and uh, we're held by time and I'm getting older. My kid's getting older. I'm starting to get older. Uh, and, and time is really what is just truly our enemy. And then that thought went through my head. God is not held by time, nor is he restrained by these hard bindings. And I love that. And that kind of sums up the whole idea. So in other words, don't get obsessed with the fact that time marches on and we get older because our God isn't held by it. So, uh, and then we slip right into 1990. Yes. Yeah, so what happened in 1990? <laughs> 1990 was, uh, you know, everybody, it's funny. Uh, the funniest uh, question I ever got from a fan was, you know, it's time, you know, you know, the lyric says it's time to move on and forget 1990. And he's like, so why did you write a song about it that you have to sing over and over on tour and always be reminded of it? <laughs> I thought, you know, True. there's a lot of, there's a lot of irony there. I like that, you know? Unless you just don't put it in the playlist ever. <laughs> you know, it's never in the set list. <laughs> yeah, we had to because, oh man, the yeah, opening intro of Manny's bass line is just insane. It's, it's uh, just that, it's just so brilliant. Um, which I, I have to say, uh, part of what makes Learn so special, it was right when we forged the relationship with Johnny Knox. And, uh, you know, we went through four drummers before we even started recording um, because I just couldn't find anybody that was really, really doing it for me. And, um, and then we, we, we were suggested this guy from Whiteheart. <laughs> yeah. I was familiar with his work in Whiteheart cause I'm a big Whiteheart fan and he was, Oh, that's cool. I well, love we, those see, years. We, 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 we weren't, uh, fans of Whiteheart. You well, know? obviously uh, it would make it, well, <laughs> it seems kind well, of an odd mix, but, uh, but you know, we, we talked to John, um, I sent him, some working demos uh and he said yeah man i've never done a metal project before I'd, I'd i'd love to and he's and so literally we fedexed him uh a copy of all the songs uh and with a click track and he said i'll be there in five days he was out in nashville and we're in cali and uh he flew out and he's like yeah man had to pick up a double pedal because I've never played double bass before. And I'm wow. like, oh my gosh, really? And I'm like, I've written double bass parts for this album, so this is going to be strange. But then he jumped on the kit, and immediately me and Manny look at each other and go, oh yeah, this, this is the guy. And uh, it just happened. It worked, and it was just magical. Um, but yeah, that, that was the beginning of that beautiful relationship with Johnny, uh, with Johnny Knox. And of course, which led into the river album, but that's for another time. Um, so 1990, uh, the song itself is just basically kind of a, a reflective thought about, um, about, uh, about deliverance, about myself, about me, um, my walk, uh, with, Christ at the time and and um, one of the things that the reason I separated deliverance into categories um, I always call it you know the first four years and I like to call those the evangelical years and then then I call um, you know once we got signed 1989 to 1992 I call those the industry years and then from 92 to 96, I call the creative years. And the reason the industry year started in 89, but 1990 is when it really started to roll because now I was with a different band. Um, the, the guys who had started it with me weren't really there anymore, even though they were on tour with me. Those that first tour, Chris left in the middle of the tour, and that's how Jim Chapman got involved because. Chaffin and I had been friends for five years already at that point. And I called him and I said, man, we need you to finish the tour. 
and he and for those of you who may not be familiar with that jim is from crucified so right right exactly so you stole somebody from crucified just so you know which was another yeah, yeah. yeah punk <laughs> band. <laughs> that, that was that was uh just for the tour though at that time yeah i was trying to steal him for for deliverance but yeah he was he wasn't having any of that uh not at that time but um but it, it was it was a real hard time for me um because I remember playing a record release party at a club that we used to play all the time uh, out in Hollywood called the Oasis. And it was owned by a, 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 an organization called the Holy Ghost Repair Factory. And they, um, you know, it was a copy shop ministry, you know, it was real small. And, uh, but, you know, every time we played, we just would pack it out. But, you know, there was a lot of ministry happening there. Um, uh, those people there at the Oasis were real, uh, loved them to death. They were, they, they, they took it seriously and they knew we were the music draw, but then they would perform the ministry. They would feed the homeless. They would go and talk to them, minister to them one-on-one. -on -one, and it was, it was awesome. Um, but we did our record release party and, uh, we had to play three shows that night because it was just jam packed. There were people waiting outside to get in. Um, and they, they sadly told us, so the, the, I'll never forget the owner, Connie, uh, just, just sadly with tears in her eyes told me, I, you, you guys can never play here again. And, uh, because this violates and goes against, you know, we're not an entertainment field. We are ministry driven and you guys have crossed over. And it's like You're too oh. big for us. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it, and it hurt. It hurt a lot because, you know, I mean, we were the band that was getting beer bottles thrown at us uh, because I would stop and preach when we were playing at the whiskey or playing at the troubadour or playing at the you know that was all that was now gone and we had moved into another phase of deliverance and 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 we were now uh being propagated as the christian metallica and uh if you remember back then you go to the christian bookstore they were actually sent out things by like frontline and rex records and and, and and all that other stuff you know and they would put deliverance and then next to it yes. sounds like you remember yes. those i yeah. remember those and um and and it was a direct uh response to the fact that the church world at that time was very anti-secular music and really really training the, the 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 children not to listen to secular music which most of them all did there was that small percentile that didn't um but we were now their alternative and and it was cool it was a tool it was something new it was something not not super new because it had already been being done with Daryl Mansfield and Resurrection Band back in the seventies, uh, Daniel Amos and and um, Vector and Common Bond and seventy sevens and yeah you know, I, I could just go on and on. But it's um, still kind of ha it still kind of happens today. I see online on Facebook all the time in these Christian mm -hmm. music things. Somebody will say, "Can anybody suggest a band that sounds like?" You know, because these right, fairly right. New, they're fairly new believers, but they want to find something equivalent to what they used to listen to. And right. You get, a, you get a mixed review of people who say, just listen to the band you were talking about. <laughs> or and then, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. some people that will make suggestions. And, and I went through that, too. I think uh, during my time in the late, mid to late 80s, I got rid of everything secular and focused just on Christian music. From like 1985, I threw away hundreds of records that I totally regret doing now. Um, sure. Find <laughs> out the yin yang. And it was only Christian music until somewhere in the early nineties where I felt like I was mature enough in my faith and in my following of Christ to, um, to bring that back in. So yeah, I, and, but people still do it. And I, and, and you still hear today and, and you still see bands identified as blah, blah, blah sounds like, and then, you know, yes. because I know yes. there are people out there in the church who may still struggle with that. So yeah, I, wow. I totally remember that. <laughs> and yeah. It, it, and it was big at that time. And, yeah. Because Christian rock um, was new. They had to, you know, it had to be labeled the church yeah. was really accepting Christian rock to begin with. So, you know, but you know, well, the hilarious part about it and, and part of the hypocrisy with it that bothered me as being 
the Christian Metallica. It's like, well, okay, the reason we're the Christian Metallica is because we listen to Metallica. We listen to Metallica. <laughs> and, 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 and it's like, you know, you guys are propagating this whole, you know, don't listen to Metallica, listen to Deliverance, you know, listen to Vengeance. And yet all of us, you know, every one of us in the SoCal bands and, and, and not, also, not only SoCal, but all the bands that were, you know, doing Christian music, we're all influenced by secular bands. So it's like, it's just seemed really, really strange to me. And I didn't like that. I, that. That was part of what was really hitting me once we started going on tour and meeting people. And, you know, first of all, I mean, you know, I'm meeting people, you know, who, and, you know, you show up in Wheeling, West Virginia or, or whatever, and, and you're, you're playing a show and they assume because you're a touring band and you have an album out, you know, you must have a fancy house with a swimming pool and, 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 you know, it's like, dude, if you only saw where I live, I live in the ghetto and my car gets repossessed and broken into and, you know, cause I can't pay my bills. And they, I mean, they just have no yeah. clue and no idea. And, you know, you, do I wake them up? Do I tell them the truth and just say, you know, no, um, no, as a matter of fact, we live on welfare, you know, I mean, you know, uh, we do the government cheese bit because we can't pay our bills being on a Christian label or being on a label in general, you know? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's like, it was really, really strange. And uh, I mean, like, I remember other bands would ask, you know, I mean, how long did it take before you actually started making money? And uh, it took a number of years. Still and, waiting. Um, <laughs> well, it did. I mean, you know, I, I, I do get to, at least um, say that I was able to live off of my art for a while. And it was nice. Uh, it didn't last forever, but, and, and it certainly didn't start out like that, but um, it was nice, but I, I certainly didn't make a, I, I pretty much made an equivalent to work at Taco Bell full time type of money, you know, <laughs> but it was something which a lot of bands. But didn't it, have. But, but yeah, exactly. And a lot of bands just didn't even hit that. You know, we were selling and also I had, a, I had great management who knew how to uh, get in there and renegotiate stuff because of obviously the labels were making money off of, uh, off of these sales and whatnot. But um, that's, uh, that's par for the course. But yeah, so 19, 1990, um, it, it was just, like I said, overall it was just this uh, year of decay and in, in a lot of ways um for me personally um i just just felt like i the band had gone in another direction it wasn't my band anymore um something had happened i had the label tugging me on this side i had uh you know my new members tugging me on this side and I, you know, my old members who had been with me for five years were gone. Uh, I was having struggles in my new marriage, uh, you know, that I just, you know, just been married and, you know, we had a kid early on and struggling with that. You know, my wife's like, you know, I don't like you going on tour and, uh, and then, you know, who's going to watch the baby and blah, 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 blah. I mean, just all sorts of stuff. So it just, it just led to a real bad uh, downtime for me in the sense that I was trying to find and rediscover who we were. And so at that point, since the evangelical focus had left, I decided I'm going to write a concept record on spiritual warfare, since that was a hot button at that time um, with the books, uh, This Present Darkness and Piercing the Darkness from Frank Peretti. And it seemed like no matter where you went in America, every church had a teaching series on these books. So I thought, you know, what a great, what a great concept for an album. And so we loosely did uh, a Bible study set to music and it took off. I mean, weapons still to this day, as you, like you said, I mean, you know, you held up the cover and said, you know, the, one of the many reissues that album just, you know, it's like, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to say it straight out. You know, every time I talk to Matt, every time I talk to Bill rocks, every time I talk to Adele over at Frontline, I just, you know, I, 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 and she, by the way, she doesn't have anything to do with the reissues. You know, she just owns weapons. Um, but, uh, and she makes sure that I'm paid for the reissues, uh, which, yeah, hats off. But uh, I always tell them, you know, can you stop flogging this dead horse to death? I mean, how many freaking reissues can you release of this 
album. How many I times mean, am I supposed God. to buy this album? <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, it's the yellow version. It's the white version. It's the black version. And I will say I didn't. A commentary <laughs> of, of, of Johnny. And this one has the, the extra re-release. I mean, there are so many things you can, I mean, it, the, the horse is dead. It, they just keep flogging it. And it's just like, move on. There's, I mean, it's like my biggest fight. And the thing is, I appreciate where Matt and Bill uh, come from because I tell them both and they both say we understand completely. But it seems like when we do want to support you and put out your new music and we, we put out, you know, your movable walls record by Jupiter six or in Matt case, in Matt's case, you know, I'll put out here what I say and I'll put out this and I'll put out that. I end up sitting on that that stuff for a long time because nobody buys it but then that and so we have to put out weapons to make money to subsidize because people will buy it and that's what i think i think it has to do with i think it's demand and and people it is it it. is i mean and then there's part then there's people who are collectors unfortunately i'm one of them but i have referred (laughs) i didn't buy the yellow reissue i (laughs) heard a dollar for like one of the earlier but some people want those different ones, but yeah, for the most part, I think it's just because they put little copies out, little presses out, they sell out, and then they have to do yeah. it. Again. So I can kind yeah. of in their aspect, it's demand. People want it, but uh, it yeah. is, it is, and and I get that part too, bro. Yeah, but as the as the artist who created it, I'm. It's you like, want to let it go. <laughs> you, well, it's like you do know that I'm much more than all of this that, you know, I'm 50 years old and I was 20 years old or 21 when I recorded that album. You guys do know I'm a lot more than this, right? I mean, and that, that, so for No, me, you must always be Thrash Jimmy, Thrash Jimmy. Yeah, thrash. exactly. No more new like. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it feels like. So, but uh, yeah, so 1990 was just kind of a, you know, don't, don't repeat that, you know, and as soon as we left the industry years, that's when we went into the creative years. And that's kind of, we were at the heart of the creative years with the learn album. And so that's what 1990 was. And then learn same thing. Um, you know, the, the good thing about, I love about those albums and those songs is there was definitely a lot of, uh, self-reflecting, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was looking down. This is where we see. are. Learn. Yeah. Learn. Yeah. Uh, the thing I love is that there is a lot of self-reflection in those lyrics. Uh, just stuff that I was going through. Um, a man's life, a boot camp, preparing him for the grave. Is there nothing more to living or so I thought I heard them say, you know, um, it, it, it was a man wrestling with his spirituality and at the same token wrestling with the fact that, you know, you're living this life, you're in a, the regular world. You can't build a glass asylum for you to live in and, and say, Oh, I'm only going to go to Christian dentists and Christian car salesmen and Christian doctors and Christian this. I mean, we live in the world and, you know, we, we of course have to exude light, but, you know, how does a guy like me who's naturally pessimistic and, um, you know, exude light. So I had to really kind of just go about my, uh, I mean, you know, like people don't realize a lot the, the clause in the early front line, front line contract, the minute George was in the band and George was an instant salesman, you know, George came out of sales. In fact, he still, you know, owns his own company. Uh, but they wanted him to do all the interviews and not me. And even though it was my band, uh, they it, they found it disastrous every time I did an interview. And it's part of it is because I just said whatever was on my head. I didn't care. I just spoke. Uh, I had no filter. And, uh, you know, especially it seemed like everybody asked the same stupid questions. Oh, what do you think of Believer? Or what do you think of this? Or what do you think of Torn Flesh? And dude, I wasn't going to hold back. I just said what I believe. Well, well, they're your fellow brothers. And it's like, so what? I don't care if they're fellow brothers. If You know, if a band sucks, a band sucks, you know? Um, and I, I just didn't care. And I was never diplomatic. And <laughs> I didn't really see... Uh, I, I, I only saw the world in black and white. And, and to be honest with you, I, I still kind of do see things like that. It's hard for me to find the gray areas. And um, 
the label was all about making money and they, they were a business and I respect that. But, you know, I was a kid. I had a lot of ideologies that I was following and, and um, I didn't completely understand them. So I was just having to learn. And in my own life, <laughs> that's the name of the uh, song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, in my own life, uh, just everything I was struggling with, uh, dealing with uh, just as a, as a person, as a believer, as a, as uh, just a responsible human being, as a father, as a you know a husband, um, and then going off and living this rock and roll thing on the weekends, and then coming home to just being Joe Normal and being the hermit that I was, hiding in the house playing Mario Kart, and, and uh, <laughs> you know that's, that you know I mean nobody could get me out to do anything you know because I was just a hermit and. You know, lo and behold, 30 years later, I'm still that guy. So, um, uh, which is hilarious. But um, that's that's where it was. It was just a time of learning about our, myself. And um, that's when leads right into the next song, Who, who Am I? Um, you know, that was exactly what was going through my head at that time. You know, number one, reading that scripture, Who Am I? That You know, you know who is man that thou art mindful? You know, and that's such a great scripture because it is if, if God being this grand, unfathomable, our um, very finite minds cannot understand the infinite, you know, and the creator of the majesty of all the universes that we can see and we cannot see. And we are this <laughs> microscopic nothing, basically insects on a planet somewhere. And yet you're mindful. And that's what, that's what I love about that scripture because it actually comes out of the Old Testament. I think Isaiah, you know, and, uh, and I know David reiterated it and said, who, are, who is man that thou art mindful of him? And then, but I love it when Isaiah says, but yet attend to the prayers and supplications of thy people. And uh, that is just, that is just phenomenal, phenomenal. And that's kind of where I was in that, in that, uh, idea again just struggling to find the balance between being a human having responsibilities of, of of being a father a husband and also just uh doing my music doing my art and being encouraged to do it but in a very francis schaefer uh type of way you know presenting it but i knew the ministry days were done they were over and um, that's what those first four years represented. And once we get, got locked into the industry, it changed. Because, I mean, you know, that for those first four years, our audience was 90% non-Christian, 10% Christian. And then by the time we were signed and everything, it was the, it flipped. You know, now it was 90, 95% Christians and maybe 5% non-Christian. So it didn't make sense to be up there and, you know, be preaching the evangelical type of style of, of, of ministering or preaching when all you're doing is preaching to the choir, literally. Right. And so I had to shift focus and I wanted to let people know, man, I'm human. I, I'm, you know, all the struggles that you come up with me after the concert and share with me, Hey, I mean, I look at porn or I look at this and I struggle with drugs and I struggle with this, but I love God. And it's like, you know, so, I'm, I'm going to clue you in. Same here. Me too. Life on the I planet. have the same, I have the same problems and you know what? Let's, let's, I, I can't pray for you in the sense that, Oh, I'm going to ask that God takes my, prowess and give it to you no i i have to say let's pray for each other in because, agreement with that. yeah yeah we're human we're human and um that's where that goes you know i don't know what the, what's the next song um, <laughs> yeah actually i mean you know whatever ones jump out as things you might want to talk about and there's a uh, reflection in the will renew the rain desperate cries Oh, like is that. reflection is reflection right after who am I? Um, renew is. Oh no, renew, yeah, renew. Oh yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was. You know what that one was? Uh, I got to tell the funny story on that one. I, I initially wrote that uh, with I was just slapping on on Manny's bass 
I was doing a slap funk, you know, down, 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 you know, and, and I wrote that riff and, uh, but Manny doesn't slap, Manny, Manny can't slap. So, uh, I had to do it on the album. So I, you know, I did the whole thing and then Manny comes in with and plays the rest of the song, you know, but, uh, the courses I had to play, but, um, that was kind of that same idea. Okay. Now it's time for me to renew my mind, renew, uh, you know, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So, um, it's just time for a renewal. I've got this time issue I dealt with. I've got, um, the, the past regrets that I've, I'm dealing with. I, I now have reached a place of I'm, I'm learning from my mistakes or at least trying to. And then I kind of find myself in a spiritual area saying, who am I? And now renew time to renew the mind. And that's kind of where that is. And, um, and, and, and I think it really came out really cool. You know, so it's almost uh, turning into a concept slash uh, journey type album where it's, very much i don't know if yeah, i ever stopped and looked at it that way that's cool yeah i tried to i always tried to when i assemble a record i always try to assemble the lyrics to do that to follow some sort of um systematic journey of where Story, i was going basically yeah. Wise. yeah um what's the next song uh After the rain oh god my, one of my that's probably my all-time favorite song from um, that album, um, John John Maddox came to me with a, a riff, and uh, and I just I just fell in love with it, and uh, that da -na 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 -na, that whole intro riff, and I just I just went just bonkers over it, and I said, "Will you allow me to?" And he's like, "Well, I've got some lyrics too," and and I read the lyrics, and the lyrics were just no offense to to John, they just weren't that good. So I took some of the ideas and I just reworded them, reworked them and, uh, and just changed everything to this, just again, very melancholy, very sad state. Um, and I went back to a place in my head where I had gone to the beach and I was looking out at the, the, the ocean in the middle of the night and, you know, the memories of myself, the slave, you know, uh, realize the one who brought the pain. Um, uh, I've only myself to blame. I think the lyric says, you know, uh, it was then I cried and that's, you, you, you know, you have this whole thing of just because you self reflect, you know, it doesn't mean that it ever ends. And maybe with me, that's part of my problem is that I tend to go back and I love to beat myself up constantly. Um, and, you know, sometimes you just gotta, you know, you, you know, what's done is done, move on. And I, I've always had a problem ever since I was a kid with that. You know, it's like, I'll just keep beating myself up for something I did five years ago, 10 years ago, six years ago or whatever. And consequently that'll bleed over and you start beating other people up for something they did five, 10 years ago. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's very un unhealthy way of living. And, um, that's what was kind of going through my head with the rain, you know, the, the, you know, the life I lived, the toll it took, but the night you found me in the rain, because it was almost like I w rediscovered salvation that night I was on the beach. And, uh, it, that's a s very special song. And it was the first time um, that I really used my real voice. I said, I'm not going to try to sound like Jeff Tate or Bruce Dickinson or Bowie or Terry Taylor or whatever. Because, you know, as a singer, you try to identify with all your influences. And, um, you know, that, that was the first time that I said, I don't want to. I just, I'm going to be me. And I went in there and I just did it. And it happened. And it was really, really cool. Uh, very, very nice song. Reflection follows that one. Um, and Reflection was actually a piece written by Mike Phillips. Um, and he had given it to me prior to him leaving Deliverance. Um, and uh, I remember we sat and worked on it. And I just thought it was beautiful. You know, it was very rush, 
you know, that doing that, doing that, doing that, doing that. It sounds just like something off of hemispheres. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And then I loved the lyrics, you know, time is a reflection of past misery so clear. And then I added my own lyrics to it. And it just seemed appropriate to go into from that to in the will. And in the will, I'd just been reading uh, about um, that whole sacrifice. And, you know, that, that, that story still perplexes me. I know there's, a, we can say, oh, it's a, well, it's a typology of Christ. And it's this and it's that. And more about, you know, are you willing to give up anything and everything, including the life of your own son, to uh, fulfill being in the will? And uh, it was just kind of that idea. idea. And uh, I liked doing all the, Egyptian or Middle Eastern style uh, guitar yeah. recording and, you know, uh, thought it was really, really cool. And we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, wasn't a song to play live. And I never wanted and meant for that song to be played live. It was just more part of, uh, again, the mental journey of, you know, you know, you have the rain. So rediscovery of salvation uh, and then reflection, just kind of remembering this sad time in your life. But, now you got to find yourself in the will, in the great will um, that is beyond you. And then we go into Desperate Cries. Desperate Cries was very cool. It was, very, it, was, it was probably the most progressive song I had written at that time with, uh, uh, without being speed metal. Everybody knew I was very technical in my rhythm style. and You know, but... This one I used my right hand or my left hand technical stuff, you know, with different chord structures and changes. Um, and it's almost a nod back to evangelical, you know. It's it's a nod back to you know, see the cars passing by, countless people walking the street, desperately hurrying where they must go, living a life, uh, living living a life, believing a lie, refusing to see what must be shown. They're dying, and. Isn't that much like today? You know, that's just people, the hustle and bustle, but no one really sees what's going on. Um, it's uh, it's a cool song. I like that song. But can we hear? Can you hear them crying with desperate cries? And I love that song. And uh, I, I, it's worth noting. I, I, um, <laughs> I accidentally, when I wrote the song on a drum machine. Uh, Back then, the drum machines were very super mechanical. They didn't let you write the way you wanted to. And I wanted the hi-hat to play a certain way and ended up playing off on this weird time signature that didn't make sense with the kick and snare pattern. And I told Knox, oh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and he's like, well, I already learned to play it like that. And I'm like, that's impossible to play. I mean, he's like... No, you can play it. It's he goes. It's just difficult. It's weird, but it's not impossible. And he goes, and it doesn't make sense. But it's during the course that it's like the snare kick hi hat thing. Uh, for those that love that kind of odd technical stuff, it's during the course where he does that weird thing. It's it's super cool. But it was all wrought from a mistake on my faulty drum programming. <laughs> <laughs> and now we know. See. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then I, you know, then we then go ahead. I was just saying, I I, I I I've had that kind of experience as a drummer. Um, I came in and there was a song that was written by somebody else with the drum machine, and they sent it, and I learned it that way. Then we got in the studio, and the same guy who wrote the song with the drum machine said, "Well, can you do something other than what was on the demo?" I'm like, <laughs> well, "I learned it." <laughs> I'm like, "I learned to play it that." And it's like, how can you tell me on the spot to do my own thing when I've already done your thing? <laughs> so, oh, it's funny. That's funny. Thought of that okay, way. So it, it happens. It happens. You know, yeah. especially you know, because with the insurgence of of using drum machines to do demos and stuff, like 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 uh, you know, back then, I mean, that's what you know, I was doing. I was using a lot of uh, drum machines, and. Uh, went through went through the Elysees and the boss and everything else, you know, I, I was convinced at one point, you know, one day I'm going to be able to just record a whole album with this, you know, and then, you know, bands like ministry and, and uh, sisters of mercy, you know, they, well, they were already doing it, you know, but I was talking about like a metal record, you know, and yeah. you know, lo and behold, it's low. It's happening every single day, you know, 
<laughs> but then we come to the close, man. To me, the uh, piece de resistance uh, of, of the album, which is Sanctuary, um, which has you know, become the closer for uh, every Deliverance concert. One of my earpieces, the other one's dying, so I'm switching over to this one. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that song is probably the most special. A, um, the reason I love it so much is because it, um, I remember hearing it the first time when it came out. I was driving down the uh, Santa Ana freeway with my sister in the past. I was in the passenger seat and uh, we were listening to the local Christian books or uh, Christian uh, radio station, KVRT. And, uh, and they said, and we have a new one here from uh, local boys, Daniel Amos. This one is called Sanctuary. And I heard it. And I was like, oh, my God. I just remember just being just floored and blown away. And it was like Bowie put into, but with Terry's voice. But the music was so beautiful. And I just remember just crying. And hey, I always I always emotionally responded to music. Um and uh, certain songs especially that, that just really moved me chord structures and everything else and uh by the way i'm pouring myself some coffee if you were wondering what i'm doing so there it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah i if you as you can see i love coffee <laughs> from the cribs different, of the famous rich and famous <laughs> yeah different different ty different types as you can see i just i i am a coffee snob so um me, it's something me and Jim Chapman have in common, and when we ever we discover a new, a new, uh, you know, bean or a new, you know, oh, this country has this bean, and you know, we we call each other, and and then we, you know, try to one up each other on, uh, you know, oh, well, do you have this coffee oh, grinder? Or do, you, do you have this kind of machine? And do you have this? And do you have that? But uh, so, um, so. We go in to do Sanctuary, and at this point, I hadn't recorded anything. I just told Terry, I'm going to do this cover of your song. And he really fought me. He didn't want it done. And because he said, you know, you, you already did um, a horrendous disc on State of Execution. Right. Now it's going to look like I'm pushing you to, like, record my yeah. songs. He's making and <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 I, and I'm like, no. I mean, you guys, you know you just didn't realize what a huge honor it is for me to be working with you. I mean, it, I mean, Terry for me was like getting to work with Brian, Eno or David Bowie or Peter Gabriel, you know? And, um, so, um, all I did <laughs> is since Manny had no idea how the song went and I didn't know how I was going to have the guitar go. I just put a click track down and told Knox, just play a beat. And I had the mic in my head, and I go, okay, vocals will start here. And I'm like, okay, uh, now we're getting ready to go into the chorus. And I go, okay, now, st and I'm like, now stay with that rhythm for eight bars. And he's there. Okay, we're getting ready. One, two, going into the next verse. Da, 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 That's exactly how it was tracked. Wow. And, and go and listen to it, and you could hear it. John doesn't hardly do any riffs or anything. And uh, the one time he veers is during the bridge. I told him, go to the ride. Dun, 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 dun. And I go, okay, now do something interesting right here because I want to break. And then that's when he did the Tom thing. And it was just, dude, it was pure magic the way it just happened because it was just him playing to a that's it. No music. And your direction. <laughs> and me telling him what to do, telling him what would be there. And there's no music, there's no guitars, there's no bass. Nobody has a clue what this is going to sound like. Terry's really nervous. And I finally just looked at him and I said, dude, no offense, but I'm producing this song. You're not, you're not really going to have anything to do with this. 
Yeah. And, uh, and so when it time came to actually put the guitars and the bass and everything else down, uh, it was, I, I really didn't have it in my head. It just kind of happened. And then, uh, when we were doing vocals, um, I just said, I, it was the end of the day. My voice was scratchy. I was tired. And I said, you know, let me go in and lay a scratch and just see what it's like. And then we'll attack it tomorrow when we come in. Terry and Gene were like, yeah, no problem. I went in there and I did it. And I was doing those, ah, that was simply a warm up. It wasn't intended to be in the song. Uh, it was just me warming up my voice. And um, I did the song in one take. Uh, I came in and, I mean, I came into the control room and Terry and Gene were just sitting there like, and they're like, Jimmy, I think this is the take. I'm like, oh, no. No way. And they're like, <laughs> and they're like, no, listen to it. And it just was it. And so they said, you know, you can go back and go double the, you know, sanctuary, you know, go and double that. But we're leaving this track. And it's like, okay, that's cool with me. And it, I mean, it really it did. It felt right. And uh, But the greatest honor <laughs> in the world was when uh, – Terry invited, we, it was during the mix down, and Terry invited all of DA, uh, Greg Flesh, Tim uh, Chandler, Jerry Chamberlain, Ed McTaggart, they're all there. And he invited them just to listen to my version of Sanctuary. And uh, I was like nervous, I was scared, I'm kind of like hiding in the corner. And Terry was just so proud of it. And, and, uh, right when it starts, Ed McTaggart, the drummer turns around and goes, it's too slow. Well, it is compared to the original, but Terry just looks at him and goes, listen. And so they sat there and they, all of them are just staring at the speakers and listening. And I'm with my head down the whole time. Cause I don't want to look, I don't want to see people's that make faces. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to. And then uh, the end comes, you know, and then Gene's doing the fade, you know, manually. And I look up, dude, there wasn't a dry eye in the studio. Wow. Everybody was, I mean, they, and they just looked at me and they started coughing and they were like, bravo, Jimmy, that's, that's unbelievable. And I look over at Terry and he just gives me a smile. That's all. He just gives me a smile. I was like, uh, man, if ever a, uh, a, a pupil with his mentor, you know, moment, that was it for me. And uh, I mean, I just really, really felt so good about it. But that's, that's why, and it closes every Deliverance show as it should, because it's had this very, what I like to call mystical, magical effect on every audience. Because, you know, since I play with so many different band members, as you well know, <laughs> uh, every time we get together and we play live and I always say, well, sanctuary is going to close. And they're like, really? I don't, I, and dude, a lot of people don't like the song. Like Chaffin doesn't like it. Uh, you know, or didn't like it rather. Uh, Glenn, same way. Jo George, when we went to Mexico, it's like, dude, that's a boring song to close with. And I'm like, you'll see, you'll know because something happens every single time we play that show that song this feeling comes over the audience and it's like just angels supernaturally just come and surround the place and a big hover tent happens i don't know any other way to describe it it's just a supernatural reaction every single time we play it and uh it's beautiful because you see people just crying and it's just unbelievable and everybody sings the ah, you know the everybody's singing that along with you and it's just a very emotional moment every time we play that song live and uh i just for me it's like not only the perfect closer for learn but it, it, anytime deliverance plays live it, it has to close with sanctuary because it's just the perfect moment <laughs> it was caught in time you know it was just perfect yeah and the thing to remember as you you say not everybody and i would I, I would admit to this um i was not familiar with with da back in huh, the yeah. days um 
I don't think I just started listening to them until probably in the past 10 years, but oh. that was a, not your song. So you were bringing something to a new audience. Thank yeah. you. This was a new deliverance song. Nobody reads a liner note to see you didn't write that. Come on. This was a new deliverance song. So yeah, you're, you're, and, and, and I think to a degree, her in this disc even, because I knew that, I knew the album name. I knew that was a very popular album by Daniel Amos. Never had it, yeah. never owned it. It was one of those bands, you know, I used to listen to a lot of Larry Norman, but never crossed over into the DA world, even though I know there's a connection. So when I heard you, <laughs> I knew that that was produced by him. I knew it was one of their songs. Had no clue Sanctuary was one of their songs. Because by this album, it was like, I didn't even realize he was that involved. So yeah, you brought it to a whole new audience and of course made it your own. And it is, it's a yeah. fantastic closer. Um, so yeah, and that's a great story. That's the kind of stuff that I'm really appreciative of, you know, being able to get, talk to you about because, you know, here we are 20 years later. I didn't know any of that stuff. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. And I, and I did notice as we were talking, I grabbed the CD. Um, and I know they do this occasionally, maybe you're not aware of it, but on the vinyl release, the songs are in different order. I don't know if it's going to mess up your, they, they have, um, so who I am and renew were moved from here to down here. And these two, oh, a lot yeah, of times we'll time, do that for to, time, purposes. For time yeah. purposes. So as you were telling the story, I'm like, man, Jimmy's confused. But then I saw that. <laughs> and then you look at the Z and they are in the right order. <laughs> They're in the right order here and they are on the right order on the, uh, the new remastered CD. So it's a vinyl thing. Uh, I don't people have to suffer with because now we're not going to know the story in the right order, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that that sucks. But vinyl is a different experience, you know. I, I it, but yeah, it, it kind of makes sense that you know to, for a time purpose, you know, because renew and what did they they swapped renew and who am I or who am or I who and renew I? start the second side and they bumped up reflection and in the will to the end of oh that's a bummer because the rain is supposed to open up side B. What a shame. Yeah. Uh, if I'd known that, I I would have made a big scene. That's probably why they didn't tell me. Well, again, you have you you have it. I don't. You I don't, don't have, have it. I don't have any of these reissues. Uh, you know, Matt eventually sends them to me, but uh, and and then Manny, uh, stupidly enough, buys them. I told him I don't know why you buy them. I mean, Matt should give you a copy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I always ask for two. I always ask for one for a collect to, to keep alone, and then one to put in a frame. Uh, you know, it's weird, dude. I don't, I don't own a CD player. I don't own um, a record player. I don't even own a traditional stereo. I haven't for years. I just have, uh, you know, my sound bars and my home pods, and that's it. I mean, that's it. and so I play everything off my phone. <laughs> and I still have the majority of my collection. I mean, I have. It is hard to see, but. I mean, I've got thousands of... Oh, I can see it. I can see it. And it goes all wow. across the room. I've got, I don't know, thousands of CDs. Of course, in years of doing a magazine and stuff, you get a lot of stuff, promotional stuff, you yeah. accumulate it. But I have thousands of CDs. So then I get this smart idea a couple of years ago. I want to get back into vinyl. You know, my wife is <laughs> shaking her head. No. So, and now we're <laughs> hundreds of vinyl pieces later. So, and that's kind of what, you know, I was doing these videos is basically join the vinyl revolution of people who are on YouTube who talk about records. And so sure it's growing and, and people do it. So I, I love the fact that they're reissuing this. I know that it's still not, you know, they put out these limited run couple hundred copies because it's not a big market. It's not, and it's not like yeah. the Christian music is going to sell thousands of copies. So, um, yeah, but it's great. And, and it is a new experience. It's kind of a return because, you know, we went through this back in the, you know, in the eighties and stuff. So yeah. 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 And I don't have a sure. an audio file system, but I have one that's decent enough to where, you know, I can notice a little difference and it's just a new experience. It's kind of a fun return to taking something out, putting it on, dropping the needle, listening oh, yeah. to songs and not just clicking the button and going about your work and the music's playing in the background with an MP3. It's you're yeah. engaged and it just, it's, I don't know. It's, Oh, I used to love that experience, man. I used to love, you know, growing up, you know, I mean, I, 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 since I was four or five years old, just, you know, you sit and stare at the vinyl while it's playing and you listen, you know, and it's, it's such a cool experience. And, and it's sad that that's kind of missed now, 
maybe I, I'm hoping people are getting to do that again, you know, with, with the reissue of vinyl is to get to experience that awesome moment of unwrapping the cellophane and, 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 and just like, yeah, getting the big to art, this. the big pictures, all of that. It's the yeah. bigness of it. No more. We, you know, little images of stuff. And oh, yeah, where you get the, the magnifying glass to try to read the lyrics of the liner notes. Yeah, you know? serious. <laughs> For sure. But, yeah, so um, so it's great. What, you know, this has been really good. I'm, I'm glad because, again, I don't think I knew a whole lot about this, uh, all the background on this album. So um, I'm hoping yeah. that other people who watch this would learn the same, and I hope that this album sells out just like that. But um, I, I hope so, too. I hope so, I, too, because it's a, it's a great it's – a, it was a great record. It was. It, it's not my favorite. Everybody obviously knows River Disturbance will always be my all-time favorite for many reasons. But uh, maybe we'll do an episode on that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. Because it's on vinyl too, so. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, uh, okay, well, I am going to um, end it there. All, All right, right, man. I, I mean, All right. anything else to add, I'll, I'll – uh, Oh, oh no no no! I, I, I the the sanctuary was definitely the closer. You know, I mean that's because uh, that was such an important part of that record for me. If if anything, for learn the the saving grace of it is is our cover of sanctuary. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna, I'm just I'm gonna ask you to hold for a second. I'm gonna pause the recording and then I'll say. Sure. Goodbye. But um. So anyway, uh, for those of you watching, hope you've enjoyed this and gotten as much out of it as I have. This has uh, been a great. Uh, recollection, recollection of all these nice stories and stuff behind this reissued album, Learn. And if you haven't got it, go get it. It is on Retroactive Records, you know, Boone's Overstock, places like that. I'll have links in there. So anyway, thanks awesome. for joining with us. And uh, we will definitely think about doing this again. And uh, thanks. For oh, yeah, man. That's, That's cool, bro. Later. <laughs>